People are insisting that my wind turbine can't possibly work and that every watt it makes will come from additional fuel burned. But today, we're gonna find out if they're right. And it's not like those people are crazy. They're pointing to the laws of thermodynamics, which basically say that energy has to come from somewhere. For instance, my first day of thermodynamics class, the professor had us draw a dotted line around a refrigerator and identify any place where energy was going in or out. Now, it's pretty obvious the energy is going in through the cord, but not so obvious where it's leaving. And in reality, it's radiating out as heat, which is why although refrigerators are really good at keeping things inside them cold, they're also good at heating the room that they're in, especially if the door gets left open. Applying the same dotted line to our gas-powered truck, the only place energy can enter is the fuel tank. That means literally anything we do with it, like driving or even using electrical stuff like the lights, uses burned fuel. But one of the major things cars do with that burnt fuel is pushing air molecules out of the way. When we drive at highway speeds, we're essentially making highway speed wind with the front of our car. And because it's resistance, we don't get to include it as energy into our system. So from that perspective, it's not looking good for our turbine. But picture the wind for a second as a jet of water. The faster it goes, the more momentum we say it has. Now we can redirect it a little bit without much effort, but as soon as we start to try to stop it, it takes a lot more force, maximizing the drag on that surface. Ow. But imagine for a moment that we have a turbine made of simulated hands. Yes, I know it looks creepy, but just hang on a sec. If they face the wind straight on, we get maximum drag, which is no different than if the water were hitting the front of the truck. But angling the hands reduces the drag and generates lift, which makes the turbine start to spin. But wait, the air still eventually impacts the vehicle, right? Yes, but if you watch my other videos in this series, I explained that wind turbines work by taking momentum from the wind thereby slowing it down. So by converting the momentum of the incoming air into mechanical energy, we're actually reducing the drag on the front of the vehicle. And yes, we're adding the drag of a wind turbine, but you tell me, what's gonna have more drag? The front end of a 78 Bronco or a modern engineered wind turbine? Now, I've attempted to make this point with literally hundreds of people in the comments most of which tell me that I need to go back to high school physics to learn why this won't work. Now, about a third of the people say, okay, I get your point. I still think it's gonna take more energy than it delivers. All right. And then there's a few people that say, this is great. This will make my Tesla run forever, which I appreciate their enthusiasm, but that would essentially be like expecting your fridge to work without plugging it in. So at this point, I don't see any other choice but to test the darn thing. I've identified a two-mile stretch of relatively straight and level road outside of town. The plan is to use cruise control to get to a consistent speed, then as we pass a starting point, zero an electronic fuel gauge tethered to the vehicle's computer. At the completion of the two-mile stretch, we'll record the average fuel consumption for that trip. Then we'll turn around and do the same thing in the opposite direction. Averaging the results of the two trips together will help compensate for any changes in elevation and wind direction. We're completing the route twice with no turbine, then four more times with the turbine, followed by two more without. That will help compensate for any atmospheric conditions that might have changed during the test. We're also leaving the engine running the entire time so there's no warm-up to be concerned about, which also means the cruise control will keep the same setting. But one thing I didn't anticipate was how hot the oven was going to get, consuming over a kilowatt for minutes at a time. The generator is wired directly to the heating elements so the thermostat can't cycle on and off and mess with our results. I intended to keep an eye on the temperature, but accidentally left the temperature probe hanging out the door. At the completion of one of the runs, I figured I would open the door and quickly toss it back in, but that didn't work out so well. 
the smell. It's getting hot in there. Oh, God. It's okay. It's a, well, okay, it's never mind. It's smoky in there, isn't it? Somebody's going to think we had a fire in here. <laughs> Whoops. I just wanted to throw the temperature gauge in there because it was getting so hot. I just wanted to see what it was getting. <laughs> no. Sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's get our last run taken care of. Once the probe was back in place and the smoke cleared, we got back on the road and continued with the test. Oh, and one more thing. Lots of people suggested getting the power from the alternator or engine because that would be more efficient. Well, it just so happens when I upgraded this 78 Bronco with the engine from a newer truck, I also installed an inverter large enough for an RV. Inverters convert the 12 volts DC of a typical car into 120 volts alternating current that household appliances are designed for. This also means we can use a variable transformer to fine tune the power going to the oven. So with the oven now being powered by the engine's alternator, we're doing two more runs to see what that does to our fuel consumption. Uh, okay, the results of our testing are in, so let's see what we've got. The average of all four runs without the turbine was 20.04 miles per gallon. Doing everything exactly the same with the turbine averaged 19.29 miles per gallon. So as many of you predicted, running the turbine did use more fuel. But check out what happened using the alternator, 18.45 miles per gallon. So it took way more fuel for the alternator to produce the same power as the wind turbine. How is that possible? Well, there's a lot going on here, so let's start by converting all the numbers to watts to make it easier to compare. With no turbine, the engine has to output a little over 25,000 watts just to maintain a constant speed. But with the turbine, the engine has to work a little harder outputting 26,000 watts for a difference of 977 watts. But if we graph the wind turbine output, it averages a little over 1300 watts from a generator that's only 80% efficient at converting mechanical power to electricity. So the turbine itself was generating 1692 watts at the shaft, which is 73% more than what the engine put into it. Okay, surely there must be something wrong with my math, right? Well, let's move on to the alternator testing to see if those numbers make any more sense. 18.45 miles per gallon translates to 27,400 watts on the engine. That's almost 2,300 watts of additional power, which seems impossible when the oven is only using 1,300. But that's before we take into account the efficiency, or should I say inefficiency, of automotive alternators. They're so bad, the peak electrical output is only 50% of the mechanical input. But listen to what happened at the end of each alternator run. That noise is the inverter warning us the vehicle voltage is low, indicating the alternator isn't keeping up with our load. So the battery was helping the alternator power the oven the whole time. To put a number on how much, I added a current meter to the alternator and ran some more tests under similar conditions. The power starts off high and drops off as the battery runs out, so I averaged it start to finish for an output of 1411 watts. To help make sense of what's going on, let's look at the Bronco from above and pretend we have x-ray vision to peer inside. The upper gauge measures oven power while the lower one measures the engine's alternator output. But prior to turning on the oven, the alternator was making 318 watts just powering the vehicle, so that should be subtracted from the 1411 to get 1093 for the oven. 
but that's less than the 1311 supplying the oven, which tells us the battery must have been supplying the difference plus any efficiency losses from the inverter. But what we really care about is that 1093 watts of extra load on the alternator. Since the alternator is likely 50% efficient at max power, this would have required nearly 2200 watts of mechanical input power from the engine. Now that we have the remaining data for our table, we can see our alternator calculations are only off by 100 watts, or 4.4%, compared to 73% with the turbine. So not only did the turbine use far less fuel than the alternator, the power it generated was substantially more than the additional load on the engine. So is this free energy or some violation of thermodynamics? No! That boundary we drew around the Bronco still applies, meaning every watt of power must come from burned fuel. The turbine is simply recovering some of that 25,000 watts that was otherwise being wasted pushing air with the front of the vehicle. And keep in mind, for our gas engine to make those 25,000 watts, it had to burn 100,000 watts of fuel. That's how incredibly inefficient gas engines are. But what about an electric vehicle? Could a system like this be used to extend the range? I don't see why not. In fact, as soon as I posted the first video on this topic, people from around the globe sent me pictures and articles claiming they'd already done it. A guy in Bulgaria built a system into his electric vehicle conversion, and a company in Colombia did a more refined version claiming 8 to 10 percent additional range. So why isn't this a standard option on electric vehicles like Tesla? Well, think about it. Would you pay an extra $10,000 for a marginal increase in range that only works at highway speeds, requires extra maintenance, makes noise, and takes up extra room in your trunk? Modern electric vehicles already have far more range than most of us are going to use on a typical day, so adding a complex system like this doesn't make sense for most consumers. But the part I loved most about this project was demonstrating an application of the scientific method, because I honestly did not know that this project was going to work. I suspected it might. Of course, as soon as I released the first video, the comment section overflowed with reasons why it couldn't possibly work. But just imagine what our world would look like if scientists and engineers only tried things that they knew would work. Airplanes, space travel, fusion reactors, forget it. Now I've been working on this project for almost a year, but you want to know what my first step was? My very first step? I ordered a textbook on wind power, and as soon as it showed up, I grabbed my highlighter and my sticky tabs and spent hours reading and rereading until I understood all of it. Because just like I tell my kids, if we want to do anything great, we have to be willing to buckle down, get educated, and learn as much as we can about the thing we want to do. And sure, making stuff is fun, and I love doing it, but I also love it when the stuff I build works. And that wouldn't happen unless I spent the time up front to understand it. Now, if you have questions about what I did, for instance, why the blades are shaped like this, or how much power they can make, go watch my explanations in videos one and two. I made that content so that people without an engineering degree can understand this stuff. And don't forget, I have a second channel, Build 2, where I post real engineering content with problem solving and coaching all for free, including the calculations from this video for those that want it. The only cost to you is spending time to watch. Lastly, if you like seeing projects where we explore applications of physics to see who actually understands them, consider visiting my Patreon page because, man, <laughs> This type of content is difficult and expensive to make. If it weren't for my patrons, this series might have died before I completed it. For any other questions regarding the Bronco, my background, or that text messaging service that I talked about, look for links down in the video description. And remember, BUILD stands for Better Understanding Involves Learning and Doing. And there is no better example of that than this project. Thanks for watching.